Hi, I'm Indy and I'm a community archaeologist for Dig Ventures and for the past four months I've been working on an Iron Age and Roman site near Whittenham in Oxfordshire. It's at the base of two Iron Age hill forts, Castle Hill and Round Hill, one of which is man-made, one of which is natural, um, and we've been looking at all the archaeology there. So we've had to leave site due to COVID-19 and we were meant to have a community excavation um, which has had to be postponed and I was doing weekly tours of the site which I'm obviously no longer able to do so we managed to get some footage of the site and we're hoping to make it into a virtual tour for you today. Now the reason that we were on site is the Earth Trust who manage the land um, are doing some development work they're making it more accessible by putting in a road and they're also planting trees. Now tree roots and any road works might disturb some of the archaeology that's below the ground so we come in before that and we uh, preserve it through the record so we excavate it and make extensive records um, of everything that's there um, so that that information isn't lost even though some of it may be disturbed through that development process. Now what we have found is um, potential um, occupation in the Bronze Age, but definite occupation throughout the Iron Age and the Roman period. Um, so that's about a thousand years of continuous occupation. And what's quite interesting is it's all agricultural. And I mean, if you go there today, you'll see it's still agricultural. So the, per the way that people are interacting with this landscape doesn't change very much over that a thousand years. And that's quite an interesting story of how people are continuing to use this land. And it's particularly interesting as there is no obvious way to get water. They're probably using wells or um, other such methods to be obtaining their water. So it seems to be that this um, land is very agriculturally productive, but there's this continuous use to want to use that as your domestic area. Um, so I will um, also warn that we've had um, human burials um, on this site, um, which we, I will talk about briefly across the video. So um, just be aware that we um, have got those remains. Um, now some of this may sound familiar to you. Um, if any of you were big Time Team fans, you'll know that um, Time Team were also at Whittenham Clumps. They were um, excavating at the base of um, Round Hill Hillfort. Um, and uh, if you want to look at that, we'll link it below, but that's episode uh, nine of season 11. Um, so, and also just remember that um, you can leave any questions you have in the live chat as we go and feel free to comment on the video. Um, and let's jump into it. So the earliest feature on site is the potential Bronze Age burrow we've got at the bottom of Trench 2. Now what's making us think that this is potentially Bronze Age is um, mainly its morphology. So it's a ring ditch which is a very V-shaped and we think it may have had a bank on the inside. We're telling this because um, the way that it is filled up it is to the slump is coming from the inside of the ditch meaning that there could possibly be a bank now banks and ditches in this ring shape are very commonly found in the bronze age now morphology alone it's very difficult to say that that's definitely what it is so we were particularly interested in the finds coming from this um, ring ditch um, now most of our datable finds are actually from a recut so the whole ditch was recut at a later date um, now the finds in terms of what we can tell you at the moment is actually not as um, nice as we should hopefully be able to do in the future because um, they seem to be either early Iron Age or late Bronze Age and in the field it's quite hard to tell the difference between those two um, two bits of pot unlike the Iron Age versus Roman which are very easy to differentiate um, they'll need to be cleaned up and sent to a specialist and that specialist will be able to tell us exactly how old that pot is um, so at this moment in time it seems to be one of the earliest things on site it's definitely um, looking like it's um, quite stereotypically um, a barrow. We've had no sorts of burials on the inside. There are internal features, but they don't seem to um, necessarily relate to the ring ditch. In fact, some of them seem to be Iron Age and the ones um, that have had finds in, they seem to be Iron Age storage pits. Um, and all the features that cut the barrow are all later. So it does seem to be the earliest um, feature in that area. So at the moment it's looking very probably um, a barrow, but we can't say for certain yet. So we'll have to watch the space um, for the specialist information to be able to confirm that for us. So one period of archaeology we knew we would find in our excavation area would be the Iron Age. And that was a, pretty much a given, given that we can see two Iron Age hill forts from where we're excavating. One of them is man-made and one of them is a natural hill. Um, so we wasn't a huge surprise to find that we had domestic settlement. Now, what is quite a surprise is the density that we had found that domestic settlement. So we're particularly, um, in terms of our Iron Age finds, we've been looking at um, roundhouses, um, which we've been identifying through ring gullies and um, 
post holes, because obviously we're not looking at um, stone structures at this stage, but we're looking at how they've had to sink those um, natural materials into the ground, therefore removing the natural geology. We can see that in the, in the ground today. And we're also looking at their storage pits. Um, so I'll talk about these in turn and how we're identifying them and what they mean and why they're there and what the Iron Age would have looked like for Whittenham clubs. So I'll start off with storage pits. So these are all um, circular pits in the ground. They um, have got very vertical sides and very flat bases. And the reason that they're digging storage pits is they're almost like Iron Age fridges. So we find them very close to domestic settlement. They're storing food. And the idea is that underground, it is a more constant and cooler temperature. So um, it's debated as to how these would have looked in the Iron Age, whether they'd have been covered with either a wood lid or maybe they were clay lined and then covered in clay. And then as soon as all the oxygen in that pit has um, run out, then you don't get any more degradation of any um, corn or other grain that you are storing in them. Um, it's quite hard to tell whether these are separated um, into different food types, as obviously that doesn't survive. And all we get is once they're emptied out at the end, and they're almost used as convenient landfill sites, which is why, in terms of what we're looking for, they're really important. We're interested in that refuse from the domestic settlement, because that's giving us an idea of what they were using. So we've been finding lots of broken bits of pot, um, which is very useful for us, as that's very datable. But we've also been finding lots of animal bone, so that's giving us an idea of the animals that these people were rearing, potentially eating, using for wool, leather working, etc. So that's why it's really important that we're collecting all of that, even if it's not the prettiest looking of artefacts. It's very important in telling us how these people are interacting with their animals. So that's what we've been looking at with the storage pits. Uh, we've also been finding post holes. Now, post holes, um, in terms of their morphology, are quite difficult to date. We've actually luckily had quite a few with finds in them, which isn't all that common. Um, but they seem to be a mixture of Iron Age and Roman, but quite a lot of them we know are definitely Iron Age, either due to they're inside a um, roundhouse or they've had Iron Age pot in them. Um, now, with um, going off post holes alone, it can be quite hard to see what shape structure you're looking at or how many structures you're looking at or over how many periods you're looking at potentially the same structure where it's moved slightly. And that's obviously because you um, are basically doing a dot to dot exercise. Now, in some places we can definitely do that. But due to the density of post holes we've had here, you could draw basically any shapes you wanted and however many you wanted and um, you would have something that looked reasonable. Um, so we've had to be quite careful with ourselves because obviously humans love to see patterns and when we've got um, we've so many post holes um, we can basically do uh, whatever we want with them. So um, we've uh, got a few that we know are definitely um, relational to each other. So particularly um, in trench four in the uh, roundhouse we've got a circle of post holes which perfectly mirrors ring ditches on the outside. So we think these uh, this is the where the wall would have been for a roundhouse and the ring ditches are almost that guttering. Obviously we're looking at thatched uh, roofs here and it's um, as we have unfortunately experienced far too much of. It rains a lot in Oxfordshire and you need to get that water away from your settlements. That's what all of these ring ditches are. They're, they're guttering. Um, for the house and the actual walls of the house are marked out by the post holes. So we can see that in trench four. We've also got um, a line of post holes in trench four for some um, a straight structure. And we've got a couple of curving ones up um, in trench two. So we can see that there would potentially have been some round structures there as well. Um, now, in terms of the ring gullies, that is for the most, that is what survives the best out of the roundhouses. So that is what we've identified. Um, that's how we've identified that we've got 13 possible roundhouses on site. So we've got, they're basically spread out across the whole site. Um, some are more convincingly roundhouses than others. Um, they use um, round um, ditches for a variety of purposes in the Iron Age. They can use them both as enclosures to keep animals. However, they, you can usually tell them apart from a roundhouse because the ditch needs to be much more substantial to work as an enclosure ditch than it does to work as a ring gully. Um, we also tend to find that any um, Iron Age roundhouses have a lot of internal features and luckily for us the geology on this site is quite easily differentiated from the archaeology because it's um, like a yellowy green chalky clay whereas the archaeology is usually a kind of more greyish brown um, silt. So they're quite easily, quite easy to the part, and we are able to see the archaeology from the geology quite easily on this site, um, which is helpful. So moving on to the Roman archaeology that we've got on site, 
Um, the first thing that um, is really obvious when you look at the plan is we've got these large uh, ditches that are running roughly east to west across um, particularly Trench 4. We also see them continuing into Trench 5 and 6. Um, now, we now know that these are Roman because we've excavated them and they are chocker full of Roman pot. Um, and they also have that very characteristic V-shaped um, shape to them. So we know that these are Roman ditches and they run right the way across Trench 4. And what's particularly interesting about them is if we look at where the archaeology on site is, we can see that it's mostly north of these ditches. And actually that small area we've got that's uh, south of them, it's relatively sparse with archaeology. So we're thinking that these could be boundary ditches marking the edge of a domestic settlement. And that's quite common in Roman periods to have these um, boundary ditches. In fact, it's common throughout uh, history um, as until you get um, modern kind of plumbed in sewerage and drainage, um, you need you still need to get rid of that water. And the easiest way to do so is to put um, these ditches going across your settlement. So you'll tend to find them uh, marking both the edges of properties. Um, they're essentially they, they double up as a fence that way as well. Um, it's not particularly easy to move your ditch. Um, so no one's shuffling the neighbours over in the night. Um, and you've also seen them on the edges of settlements marking um, the edge of um, domestic settlements. Um, so that's what we think we're looking at here. And quite um, interesting uh, with that as well as we can see this very large Roman building on the other side of these ditches. Um, this couldn't look more stereotypically Roman. So it's 30 metres long and um, it's got these square columns running along them as well, um, which are potentially uh, for a, a raised floor surface, or um, which could be if there was heating running underneath, um, or it could be if it was some sort of barn or storage building that needed to be raised off the ground as well. We'll put in this video of um, David standing on one side of it and me filming on the other, and you can just get an idea of how uh, large this is on the ground. Um, what but we're clearly seeing is that we've got some sort of villa or farmstead complex going on on this site. So um, villa isn't necessarily how we, a Roman villa isn't how we would think of it. Um, it's, it is more of a farmstead. They Basically, they mean the same thing. So you'll have a mixture of um, buildings that people are living in, and that's where you might see um, your mosaics. We know that Time Team were founding Tessera, so there's clearly some buildings in this uh, Roman building, this area that have mosaic floors. Um, so far, there's no evidence of fine mosaics. They do seem to be much more like outdoor work floors. Um, and we also know that um, there would have been all these auxiliary buildings, of which we found two um, associated with the villas that wouldn't have just been uh, where people are living. So uh, the two that we've um, come across on site that are definitely these auxiliary buildings um, have been two corn dryers. So we've had one in Trench 4 and we've had one in um, Trench 3. OK, so moving on to what we've actually been pulling out the ground um, for the Roman period. Um, I've had to write a list because there are a lot of things and every time I tried to film this for the first time I, I kept on missing something off the list. So if I keep looking down for this segment that's that's why, because there's too many things to remember. It's been four months and it's been chocker with stuff, so that's why. So the first thing that um, if you were to ever walk past our site, you will realise that we've been doing is there's white buckets everywhere. And the reason there's white buckets everywhere is because we've been taking uh, soil samples and we've been taking them for a multitude of reasons. Um, the one that is should be the most exciting in terms of watching the space for post -ex is we plan on doing environmental processing. So that's going to be looking at if we have any um, maybe seeds or any burnt remains of anything organic that wouldn't normally survive, but survives through being carbonised, um, we will be able to see that left in the soil, even though it's usually very small fragments. So that's going to require someone looking through it with a, a microscope and tweezers, um, which obviously we don't have the capability to do in the field, which is why we put all that soil in a bucket so it can be done um, at a later date. Um, now, what will be particularly exciting to look at in terms of soil samples will be the ones taken from the corn dryers. So you'll see that in the pictures of the corn dryers, that's got in some places it's black and some places it's red on the base. And that's because um, a corn dryer obviously requires a heat source in order to dry the corn. And that's going to mean that they're burning wood, but also they're heating up um, their grains that they're eating. Some of them may not dry, but in fact burn, and we may see, um, if they've not been fully cleaned out at the end of its use, we may see some of that charred uh, grain, seeds, or uh, wood that was um, in the corn dryer. So we've got lots and lots of samples from the corn dryer, um, both of them. So 
if anywhere we're going to get some burnt remains, hopefully it should be from them. But we've also taken environmental samples from a variety of pits and ditches as well to see if we can get any of that data. And the Earth Trust plan on using um, that data as well to inform which trees they plant back um, when they wood that area over, which is pretty cool because not um, a lot of companies would put that much thought into the trees that they're putting in. Um, so that's quite exciting for us. The other type of samples that we've been taking on site have been for the burials that we've got. So we've got about 40 burials across the whole site, um, of which we think are roughly divided into two cemeteries. And apart from the three probable um, Iron Age burials I talked about earlier, we think the rest are all probably Roman. Um, now, the reason that we've got so many soil samples is because um, we need to make sure that we quite extensively sample um, any burial context, as um, there are quite a lot of small bones in the human body. Um, that particularly as well if we're looking at younger individuals and where their bones haven't fully fused, um, these can be very easily missed um, as we're excavating despite our best efforts. So we make sure that we, um, we take up quite a lot of the sample um, up from around the body so that we can make sure that we um, get any of those um, small bits of bone. And it's also quite important because sometimes we can test for other things. So it might be that there is evidence of parasites, particularly um, that's why we take samples from the stomach area. Or it could be that they um, had small artefacts on them that were missed, maybe beads from jewellery or something like that. Which is why, um, whilst it's very rarely the case, it's important to take the samples just in case. In terms of what we've actually had in terms of finds from the burials, um, we've mostly had quite a lot of coffin nails. Now we've had um, quite a lot of them have come from two burials. Um, we can see that this picture, these are all from one um, burial context. So this um, individual we think is almost certainly buried in a coffin. And a couple of the others were probably uh, were also found with nails, so were probably found in coffins too. Um, some of them, though, were pretty sure were probably buried in some sort of shroud or without a coffin, as their body is slightly more tightly bound, or there just simply wouldn't have been room in the grave cut to have fit a coffin as well. We've also had, which um, is definitely when people ask me in the future, what's your favourite or the best thing you've ever found, or what's your coolest find and I'm usually like scraping for an answer because I'm like well I've found a lot of nails and I found found a lot of things that look like pot and weren't um, would be the bone Roman bone hair comb um, which I apologize as a tongue twister so I'm going to just call it a comb from now on um, that um, we found um, I found one in a um, in a burial context and then um, Ben also found another one that's very similar in a different burial, so having two in one site um, is quite special. So they've um, they look um, they look a bit comparable to Nick Combs if you think of how um, it's something that we've still got today, except these are quite ornate um, decorated pieces made out of animal bone. Um, they've got um, concentric ring circles. The two bones, um, the two combs are slightly different shapes, but they, they're very similar and they um, look very similar to one found in Dorchester, uh, Roman Dorchester, which is um, very nearby to the clumps as well. Um, so on to the more the artefacts that we've been finding that are related to the, to the living. Um, one um, thing that um, some of you who are in the finds room would have seen, we had a um, uh, the Roman tile that had the paw print in, so um, I think everyone in there was looking through books to see what animal it was, and you identified it as a fox. We found another one in the last week that we were on site, which we think was um, imprinted by a dog. So what's happened there is uh, they leave the tiles all out to dry, and then um, not all animals as easily controlled as humans, and they don't know to not walk across there when there's tiles out drying, and so they leave footprints in all the tiles. Um, and that's just, it's cute, it's sweet, I like those kind of finds. Um, we've also had a lot of domestic um, artefacts. So we've had um, a strainer, uh, which was Nat's favourite find. You can see it clearly functions the same way strainers do today. It looks very familiar. It's a, a bowl with holes in the bottom. It's, you don't, some things don't need to be reinvented, they just work. Um, and that just, it looks so familiar. I think I like, I like finds that look familiar. I've, I've noticed as I'm going through the ones I like that we found at Whittenham. Um, we have an iron spoon. It looks a lot like a serving spoon. And we've also had a complete bowl found by David, um, which um, it looks to be Samian. However, we think that it might actually be fake Samian. So this is copycat local where 
that um, is imitating the same yin that's produced in Gaul, France. So this is um, in the Roman period, it's very uh, popular. Um, it's dining wear, table wear, that it's not the stuff you're storing your food in or transporting it in, but it's the stuff you're eating it off at the table. It's, it's your nice looking um, ceramic materials. And as with we get things nowadays, you can't quite afford the imported one from Italy or France. You've got the one that was made locally instead, but looks almost the same. So we think that it could actually be, um, that one could be some co copycat wear. We've also had some real Samian on site as well, as well as Amphora, which um, Amphora is a bit like Roman plastic. It's what they transport things in. And then once it's um, finished its function of transporting either your olive oil or your wine or whatever it is you're preserving in that olive oil or wine, it's redundant and they get they get binned. Um, so we've had quite a lot of Amphora storage vessels and We've had the nicer, finer dining wares as well. So we've had a real range of the types of ceramics we would expect with domestic living. So that concludes our tour of Whittenham Clumps. If you've got any questions about either something I said in the video or something that I forgot to say in the video, um, just leave them below and the team will get back to you. Um, and keep an eye out because we will be releasing more videos. So if you're uh, particularly interested in the uh, human remains I was talking about, Maya will be doing a video on what we can learn from human remains in archaeology. And if you're interested in anything artifact related, Johanna is going to be um, putting out videos um, on what we can learn from artifacts. And um, then David and I will be helping out with that because we're currently storing quite a lot of the Wittenham artifacts um, in our homes. So we can do little segments on exactly what we can learn from individual artifacts in a bit more detail and the whole team will be putting out videos on a variety of topics both to do with uh, projects that um, DV have done and may be familiar to you and also ones just about archaeology in general so do keep an eye out as we will be posting um, videos um, quite regularly um, so that people can still be learning and doing archaeology despite the Covid lockdown situation that's happening both in the UK and across the whole world right now so um, we are trying to have a bit of fun archaeology on the side as well, so um, do stay tuned for all those videos and as I said before, if you've got any questions, comment them down below and we'll get back to you on that.